Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's phlebotomy webinar on blood diversion and culture contamination. This is Heidi Zunker, an education specialist for Mayo Clinic Laboratories. Our presenters today are Dr. Brad Karen, Division Chair of Clinical Core Laboratory Services, and Michelle Legrid, a quality specialist in the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology, both at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Just a couple of things to remind everyone before we begin today. There will be a question and answer session at the end of the program. You can submit questions online via the Q&A icon on Zoom. Please only use the chat function for any technical issues. Today's program is being recorded and will be posted to our website in a few weeks. And now I'll turn things over to our presenters. Thank you so much, Heidi. I'm Brad Karen, and as Heidi mentioned, I'm the chair of the Division of Clinical Core Laboratory Services that oversees our lab services phlebotomy group. Happy to be here today to present with uh, Michelle, who Legrid is the quality specialist for lab services. Um, as you can see here, we have no financial disclosures related to this um, presentation and will not be discussing any off-label usage. So what we're going to go through today, we're going to define blood culture contamination, um, list the downstream cost and care consequences of blood culture contamination, and describe to you our hard-earned lessons over the last year plus uh, on considerations and potential obstacles to implementing a blood diversion device um, in, in a hospital phlebotomy practice in order to reduce blood culture contamination. So this first uh, part of my presentation, I'm just gonna set some sort of baseline understanding, some definitions of bloodstream infection, bacteremia, sepsis, and the background on, on why blood cultures are so important um, in our hospital practices right now. So again, definitions, bloodstream infection is the presence of an infectious organism in the blood. The blood is sterile, we should never have infectious organisms in our circulating in our blood and the presence of a blood any of them, a bloodstream infection is an abnormal and very dangerous situation. If that organism happens to be a bacteria, then that is by definition bacteremia. So bacteremia means there is a bacteria in our, circulating in our blood and is a, again, a, a very serious life-threatening condition that needs treatment with antibiotics and support in, in, in hospital care um, oftentimes um, to prevent death or adverse consequences. Uh, related to this idea of bacteremia and having circulating infectious organisms in our blood is this idea of sepsis. And there are a lot of different definitions of sepsis and I could probably read four or five from different organizations, but um, one of them is, uh, I've put here one of the ones is a life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by a dysregulated host immune response to infection. So sepsis is, yes, you have a systemic infection, but what's hurting you is not the infectious organism, the pathogen growing in your body that is going to, can certainly hurt you and can, and even, you know, kill you. Um, but in sepsis, it's a syndrome that is really related to the body's immune response to that infection, which causes uh, damage of our, our organs and our body and oftentimes death. Septic shock is the worst form of sepsis. It's sepsis with end organ dysfunction, often multiple organs failing, which is very, very bad prognosis in the ICU. Multiple organ fa failure has a very high uh, death rate, um, combined with systemic hypotension. And septic shock is, is essentially always life-threatening condition. Why do we care so much about sepsis? Why are we reading and developing all these pathways for sepsis response? Well, it's 1.7 million adults in the US each year will develop sepsis. Um, and there are different groups of statistics you can get. I got these from the CDC website and other sources. Um, one source would say one in three patients who die in the hospital had sepsis during their hospitalization. Another source uh, indicated up to 50% of hospital deaths are due to sepsis. So clearly this is a very um, a dangerous condition and responsible for a third to a half of all hospital deaths 
can be uh, attributed to sepsis. 350,000 adults each year die in the hospital or shortly after hospital discharge in hospice due to sepsis. And importantly, why, why it's important because we can prevent sepsis, uh, the infection, so sepsis is a life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by the, our body's response to an infection. That infection starts before a patient gets to the hospital in 87% of cases. So again, if you acquire a, an infection in the hospital and, and die of a septic shock, that's tragedy and, and preventable uh, by better hospital practices. But almost 90% of patients are coming to the hospital with these infections. And so if we can detect those infections and detect the early signs of sepsis, we can prevent these deaths and, and, and loss of life, loss of function due to sepsis. And it's expensive. That's certainly the money we spend in the healthcare system. It's not important as the lives we lose, but we do spend an estimated $24 billion each year on uh, hospital healthcare expenses due to, to sepsis. So again, patients are coming to the hospital with infections that end in potentially even early signs of sepsis. And all of these sepsis response protocols are predicated on the idea that we have this sort of golden six hours, um, that whenever the earliest signs of sepsis starts, if we can detect those within about six hours, there's a window where treatment, and we'll talk about the treatment, um, is likely to improve outcomes. If we're delayed and we're, we're, we're losing, we're not detecting that early signs of sepsis and infection early, well, again, for each hour, we, we fail to detect those early warning signs of sepsis, mortality in the hospital increases by one to 2%. So it really is a race against time um, to find patients who have infections and early signs of sepsis and to treat them. How do we find them? What is the detection of sepsis? Well, it relies on the lab. So biomarkers, which include lactate, procalcitonin, neutrophil count, white blood cell count, uh, and others are the traditional laboratory tests or biomarkers of sepsis. The conventional one, they're even more uh, newer, uh, not yet sort of uh, established biomarkers. Um, vital signs. So again, it really comes down to some basic lab tests um, and, and vital signs, uh, the respiratory rate and temperature and heart rate, blood pressure. Um, and then that's the detection of sepsis. And then to detect the organism causing the sepsis, and oftentimes, again, to prevent the worst consequences of sepsis, we need to understand what's the infection and treat it, prevent that from causing that further dysregulated immune response. And to do that, we have blood cultures. And those are really the only tools in the tool belt few biomarkers, our blood cultures, and vital signs, and the systems we have to put together flags for who might have sepsis based on the vital signs and biomarkers, the lab tests. Treatment of sepsis has not changed much to over 10 plus years where sepsis response has been a big issue. There's debate about certain things like steroids, but basically it's fluids, um, blood pressure support with vasopressors, red cells if needed to, for oxygen carrying capacity, and early antibiotic therapy um, after blood cultures are obtained. And so again, we have this magic six hours um, where we need to detect sepsis, get these labs measured, determine the patient has sepsis, get a blood culture drawn, and then start antibiotics that are broad spectrum. And then again, based on the results of a blood culture or urinary tract culture or uh, the culture of an affected site, tailor those antibiotics to make sure they're effective. If we have to wait, um, so if we give the antibiotics before we culture the blood, we really lose that chance to identify the organism and to tailor the antibiotics to make sure they're effective. But if we have to wait to do the blood cultures, um, then we're just losing that valuable time. So sepsis response systems are really focused on early lab tests and vital signs and information management to flag potential patients with potential sepsis, and then the systems to get those labs drawn quickly and to get blood cultures drawn quickly so that we can give antibiotics and, and intervene in those sort of magic six hours. 
A few things about blood culture, sort of bonus content, not directly related to contamination and diversion, but um, there's pushback in the, some places. You'll hear pushback on, well, we don't want to draw the cultures as soon as the patients hit the ED or the ICU. We want to wait till they spike a fever, because if we wait till the patient spikes a fever, we'll have a better chance of finding the, uh, the bacteremia, the, the bloodstream infection, identifying it. Study from 2008, a little older now, but they really were asking the question, a large study, asking the question, does it really matter when we draw a blood culture relative to when the patient spikes a fever? And they found there was no relationship between the time of culture, when the blood culture was drawn relative to the fever spiking or Tmax in the patient. And so this led to the recommendations as the sepsis protocols were being identified that um, when you suspect sepsis, get the labs, the lactate, the procalcitonin, and the white counts, the vital signs done as quickly as possible, um, get the blood cultures done as quickly as possible, and then start your sepsis intervention. Oftentimes, more than one um, set of cultures will be ordered or needed. Um, and so for those subsequent, once you've done that first one and started your antibiotics, now you've, again, that you wanna get your first culture, set of cultures before antibiotics. Once you've done that, Subsequent orders for blood cultures, which may be needed based on a case by case basis for patients, really can be drawn when it's convenient. We don't have to wait for the fever to spike for those or do it with any particular time. So what is a set or a order for blood culture? And I think many of you probably know this. When we could talk about a, a, blood, a set of blood cultures or an order for blood cultures, one blood culture order, is going to contain two separate peripheral venipunctures uh, that we, from each venipuncture, will fill one set of blood culture bottles. So two venipunctures and two sets of blood culture bottles will be one blood culture order, why we call it a, a, a set of blood cultures. Why do we do that? Well, that is based on the ability to differentiate bacteremia from blood culture contamination. Blood culture contamination is the positive blood culture in the absence of bacteremia. It's a false positive test result due to contamination of the blood culture bottle by the bacteria, bacterial flora uh, that live on the skin. And those flora, those flora can come from the patient and that skin, that would be kind of most common, but they really can come from anywhere. So we on the phlebotomist and the patient and the nurses and everybody caring for the patient has bacteria on their skin they can get find their way onto non-sterile supplies like syringes or the bottle cap. They can find their way onto the environment around the patient, the beds, the railings, um, the sheets. And so any way any of those skin flora end up in the blood culture bottle, that results in blood culture contamination. It's a false positive, positive culture in the absence of bacteremia in the patient. Contamination happens at the point of collection and dosing of blood culture bottles. It really can't happen after that. So again, that is the reason why one order for blood cultures contains two venipunctures. If we cleanse and disinfect the skin twice, uh, two separate times in two separate locations, if we draw that blood and dose the bottles on two separate occasions, then if one of those happens to have an environmental contamination or a, or a normal flora contamination, um, likely the other one won't. And so we can help differentiate bacteremia from contamination by having those multiple um, venipuncture dosing events that form a blood culture set. And so the contamination is likely gonna be a one set of bottles that becomes positive for skin flora with the other set negative, would be supporting the idea of a contaminated blood culture, not a bacteremia. So a lot of you and some of you submitted questions ahead of time. The question is, what's the cost of a contaminated blood culture? And it's a really hard question to answer. Um, certainly there's a cost in terms of we give antibiotics the patient doesn't need, which increases antimicrobial resistance, can have adverse consequences for that patient and really society as a whole, that's hard to measure. It can prolong the hospital stay. And that's where when we try to put a dollar amount on it, we're usually saying, well, what is the extra lab test an antibiotic test, what does that cost? And then how much longer does the patient stay in the hospital bed, which is the real cost? 
And that there is a lot of data out there published on the cost of contaminated cultures. It has changed with more modern lab tests where we can do rapid ID. We don't longer have to wait two or three days before something grows in a blood culture to identify it, do susceptibility testing and decide is this a contaminant or not. Um, and so that's why it's gotten difficult to estimate the cost of contaminated cultures. Um, but the rapid ID itself does cost uh, more money than conventional um, culture methodology. So the best estimates that are published right now, and some of these do come from these companies making these diversion devices, is that a contaminated culture costs somewhere between four and $10,000 per contaminated culture in predominantly in extra length of stay, but also in lab testing and antibiotic administration. So before we move on and focus on diversion devices and contamination methods, and techniques to reduce contamination, um, we're gonna worry about contamination. We're also gonna worry about yield. So if the patient really has bacteremia, we wanna be confident we can identify the bacteria causing it. So the yield, the chances of a blood culture being positive in a patient who does have bacteremia, the sensitivity essentially of cultures, um, goes up based on a number of factors, but the primary one being the amount of blood we culture. So the yield goes up about 3% for every milliliter blood culture between five and 20 milliliters. And a study done here some time ago at Mayo Clinic showed the yield actually continues to rise between 20 and 30 milliliters, but more slowly. So here in our practice, we actually have a standard of blood, adult blood culture, two venipunctures, each with three blood culture bottles uh, of 10 mils filled. So three, 30 mils per venipuncture or 60 milliliters total standard adult blood culture is our standard practice. We wanna increase that yield by going above the 20 milliliters per culture, uh, but most hospitals uh, in where you are probably at standard culture is two venipunctures each with 20 mils, a 40 mil total adult blood culture. All right, so I'll say a few words about blood culture contamination before I turn this over to my uh, colleague, Michelle, to um, talk about our experience. So, is diversion device the only thing we can do to improve our blood culture contamination rate? No, absolutely not. I used to give a talk about called chlorhexidine versus iodine, the epic battle. Battle's kind of over, chlorhexidine won, but skin antisepsis is clearly important. This is a review of a 10-year period of all, uh, all studies comparing chlorhexidine, iodine, and other skin disinfections, disinfectants for blood culture draws. There was no clear advantage over of chlorhexidine over an alcoholic tincture of iodine. Chlorhexidine and tincture of iodine may be better than povidone iodine, but there was a caution that that study compared an alcoholic preparation of chlorhexidine to a aqueous iodine prep. So basically, uh, uh, alcoholic iodine prep and chlorhexidine, which is an alcohol-based disinfection, both are effective skin disinfections. The studies did find clear evidence that prepackaged skin preparation uh, disinfection pads were superior to you know, using a gauze pad from a bottle. And so the epic battle between chlorhexidine and iodine was won when the ma major manufacturers of iodine prepackaged pa pack uh, uh, swabs stopped making those. And therefore, most of us probably use chlorhexidine. But either way, we know our experience is with one of those other products used consistently, we can get our blood culture contamination rates down in the rate of two to 3%. What about the people? Do the people matter? And this is one of my favorite studies because it shows how important all of you are. And it was actually done by a good friend of mine who was at Emory University at the time. And it was a prospective study comparing culture contamination rates between times and shifts that only phlebotomists collected blood cultures versus lots of other staff, nurses, residents, attending physicians. Study didn't really specify what the skin uh, disinfection process was, but clearly the blood culture contamination rate when phlebotomists were drawing cultures, 1.1% was significantly lower than the 5% when non-lab staff were collecting. So clearly the competency and the, the number and nature of the staff performing blood cultures matters and this study found that the cost avoidance due to contaminated cultures would more than pay for a phlebotomy service to collect all blood cultures. 
So again, where's the bar today and what are the factors we need to consider? Well, we know that disinfection matters and we should be using chlorhexidine or an alcoholic prepackaged preparation of iodine of which there really aren't any anymore. So that kind of leaves us with chlorhexidine for skin disinfection. Um, we, we know that the number of staff and training of staff and is important. And we know that one study at least showed that phlebotomists do this better than other staff. So if we use the right disinfection and we train our staff, limited number of staff to do this, they stay competent. We, our experience and that of many other institutions shows you can get blood culture contamination rates to stay consistently in this rate of two to two and a half percent. And the CLSI and College of American Pathologists and other organizations put out a guideline that said the threshold of your blood culture contamination rate should be less than 3%. So we've years and years, decades and decades done these studies. We know we have to train our staff, hopefully use a dedicated phlebotomy team, consistent the competency of that skin preparation. We keep our contamination rates less than you know, 3% and the two to two and a half percent. And we say, okay, we're done, right? This is, this is as good as we can do. Well, that was the case in the last, until five years ago or so, five to 10 years, last five to 10 years, when these diversion devices began to be investigated and they say, but wait, what about the skin plug? So what's the skin plug? Again, despite our best efforts of using that chlorhexidine prepackaged pad, to decontaminate the skin, we can never remove all bacteria from the skin. Bacteria are gonna hide in hair follicles and deep crevices of the skin that we're just not gonna be able to truly decontaminate skin. And during venipuncture, we get that small piece of skin, the skin plug um, that goes through the needle directly into the blood culture bottle. And is thought, um, basically, uh, not a lot of great evidence, but thought, to be the source of a significant amount of blood culture contamination. So the idea that these groups came up with, who now manufacture these devices, but behind before that, the scientists who were studying this, looked at if we could take that first little bit of blood, and that first little bit could vary from 200 microliters to two milliliters, and divert it so it doesn't enter the bottle, could that allow us to have contaminated rates consistently that are, let's say, below 1%? which no group has really shown they can do consistently just with the other efforts I've talked about. And the answer is so far, at least in some studies, yes. With the use of all of these things, right skin antisepsis, the trained staff, competent staff, and the blood culture diversion device, rather than hitting this plateau of two to two and a half percent contamination rate, some institutions consistently over long periods of time, months or years, are able to maintain contamination rates below 1%. And so there's this discussion now, should the threat, the target be lower than 3%? And there's discussions among various groups that either lower that to one and a half or 1%. So in that context, we wanted to do a pilot ourselves. We are one of those places, our contamination rate, you'll see our baseline was I think 1.6%, 1.3%. So you know, we've been, we've been holding in the under 2% contamination rate for most of the time, but we wanted to say, wow, you know, we still maybe have some opportunity here. Could we use a diversion device? Um, and this was a trial of one uh, blood diversion device over 16 weeks, which is phase one with one particular device that only did uh, direct to media uh, inoculation of the bottle. And then a phase two of eight weeks where you used both that device and a syringe device to try more allow more flexibility for our phlebotomist and how to draw it. And our goal was to reduce blood culture contamination by 50% or more from our baseline rate. And Michelle's gonna to talk to you about that rate and maintain a blood culture contamination rate less than 0.5%. So we really thought to justify the cost of these devices, we wanna see really uh, market increases in improvement in blood culture contamination because we just struggled to truly identify the cost of contamination, but we know it's there. So we just said, can we hit 50% reduction from a baseline and maintain blood culture contamination rates less than 0.5%? We know we could never do that with our current process and see that the devices are used most of the time that they're easy to use. 
So with this, I'll turn it over to Michelle to describe our experience. Thank you very much, Dr. Karen. Um, welcome everyone. In this next phase of the presentation, we'll be talking about the pilot diversion device design, the results and our lessons learned. Next slide, please. So before we could actually start the design of the pilot phase, we really did need to determine what sort of data collection tools we were going to use to capture the information that we wanted to gather. So that also included what data do we really wanna look at? And our decision was, is that we really wanted to look at the total blood culture draws, what, how many were drawn in with our normal practice and how many were drawn with the diversion vice, as well as the total number of contaminants and where were those contaminants located? Were they located in the regular culture draw or in the diversion device culture draw, as well as our compliance rate? How frequently was this device being used so that we had all the necessary information to make a good decision and to see really truly how functional and useful this, this new device could be. We also needed to determine who was gonna collect and provide that data. So we reached out to our colleagues in bacteriology to see if they were able to provide that information for us from any reporting structure that they had. And lo and behold, they were. So every week I received information from them that I shared with the team of individuals that we determined we'd need to review this data and should be part of this, this pilot, which did include um, laboratory services, operation managers, supervisors, our medical directors, as well as individuals from the bacteriology lab so they could answer any clinical questions, as well as representatives from the company. Next slide. So, now that we've got had everything in place as to what we needed, who was gonna do it, we really did need to find out what our baseline contamination was. Here at Mayo, this is reported monthly by our bacteriology lab to certain areas within our facility. So it was very easy for me to compile that information. Looking at the pilot length and determining that the pilot really was gonna run eight to 12 weeks, the team decided that it would, to set that baseline contamination rate, we should look at the previous two months and have an average. So our average contamination rate for the previous two months from when the pilot started was 1.32%. And that's what we used as our baseline data. Also as part of this design, we needed to determine who was going to, who the collections were going to be done on. And that we made the decision to do all adult peripheral blood cultures, so no line collections, with a direct to media blood diversion device, so directly from the patient to the bottle. Now, our adult patient population consisted of all ages from 18 to 100, so there was no pediatric collections involved in this. This truly was based off of our adult patient population. We also knew that staff needed to be trained prior to this pilot so they knew how to use the device. So we worked with the company to have them come on site and provided, um, provide training to what we call super users, those individuals here on site that work in phlebotomy and our education specialists and the assistants to have that firsthand knowledge. So when the company was no longer on site, they could address and answer any questions and assist with any training of new staff coming on. We did receive company support as well for training of, our, of all the laboratory services staff here at lab services in the inpatient setting. So they were here for several days, had drop-in sessions to ensure that staff knew. And that training did consist of a video on how to use the device, um, Myself and our education specialist created what we called our um, diversion procedure so that the steps in order to do the collection match the usage of the diversion device, which was shared with the staff as well. We wanted to ensure that everything that we did 
would support the staff and make this a successful pilot. Also part of this process was to, to determine how were we going to be able to know the difference between a normal standard collection versus the diversion device collection? What could we do? Unfortunately, with our collection system that we use to have something created in a short amount of time so that it was um, automatic within the collection system was not feasible. So we looked at how the process flows through the collection system and what questions were asked and what sort of pop-ups came up and discovered that the lab services staff had the availability to actually enter the name or a keyword for that device in what, is, in what was called the source site box that was easily searchable by bacteriology when they were running their reports. So now we have a manual process that requires staff to remember to do this or to take the time to do this or to do it as instructed. So we knew that there was a potential to significantly underestimate the usage of the devices, but this was our only means to make this happen. Next slide, please. As we continued with the design, we knew that we wanted to monitor the overall combined contamination rate. We felt that that would give us some very good information as to um, was the product being used, was it not being used in comparison to what was being reported as compliance. We also needed to ensure that we had the information um, for when it was used and when routine collection was done, as well as the compliance rate. Because we all know that um, in order to have a good pilot, you will, it, it's important to have a high compliance rate. It's important to have staff utilizing the device that's being looked at as frequently as possible. And that we were expecting to have a compliance rate at 75% or greater to ensure that it was being looked at appropriately. And also, we needed to make sure that those contamination rates were less than 0.5% as the published studies indicated could happen. We also knew that in the patient populations that we were assessing, the difficult sticks and or minimum blood volumes from these critically ill patients may have an impact on that compliance rate. We did do the direct to media device alone which in our laboratory services setting is significantly different from when the lab services staff do blood cultures. They're very used to a syringe and a transfer into the culture bottle. So this did require some additional training for them, but it also ensured that the best sample was being collected because we all know when you can go directly from a patient into a bottle or a collection tube, it reduces the ability to have that sample become contaminated in any way. So there was no syringes in this first phase that, that were utilized. It was simply direct to media. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so we had planned for eight weeks. And as we continued to move through that process, we realized that we were seeing extremely low um, compliance rates. So myself and the education team went back to the staff. We provided additional information why it was so important to utilize this device, as well as some additional training for those who didn't feel com comfortable. We asked what some of the restrictions were, and we discovered that Staff were only using the device on the first venipuncture of the set. As Dr. Karen mentioned here, we do two venipunctures. So they would use it on one venipuncture and not the other. Well, to ensure that we were meeting our compliance rate that we wanted to rate, we did extend it for an additional eight weeks, taking the pilot to 16 weeks, which in turn, we also asked that the staff use this device for each and every venipuncture adult collection, no matter what, to ensure we were really truly getting the value for, for what this device had promised or what the studies published studies showed that this could do. 
We did see an increase in the compliance rate to a little over 40% after the reminders and after the change in the practice. But unfortunately, those compliance rate did decrease again. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so how many blood cultures did we do over that 16 week trial? Well, we did 13,248. How many cultures were used or collected with the diversion device? 3,482. So in the 16 week period, there was 20, the, the average was 20, 26% compliance with an overall contamination rate. And this would be the blended rate of 1.1%. So as, as you can see, there was 152 that were contaminated out of that little over 13,000 for a blended rate of 1.1%. The device contamination rate, which was the direct to media. So again, it was going directly from the patient into the bottle without the need for transferring or any of those other steps that are required was actually at 0.3%, which was below the 0.5% that we had set. It also showed us that our standard draw or our normal draw contamination rate was 1.4%. So in comparison to the baseline data, when you look at this, um, <clears throat> the overall rate was just a little bit higher than our baseline of 1.32%. So we knew the device worked in comparison to the regular draws though, we really didn't see a significant change either way for us to say, well, we met our objective of 50% reduction. Next slide, please. So the question becomes, was the pilot, pilot successful? Well, it was to a point. We achieved the 50% reduction compared to baseline and contamination rate of less than 0.5% after the entire process when that device was used. But when we looked at the overall contamination rate, no, 1.1%, it was a small difference. It was only 0.2% less than what our baseline was. But this again was only off of 26% compliance. So 26% of the staff utilized the device. So was this really a true pilot? that gave us really what we needed. At this point, we don't have the answer. All we know is we have the numbers based on, on the data that we collected. So on our standard practice, when no device was used, the contamination rate was 1.4%, which is truly consistent with the 1.2% baseline. So really nothing changed in, in that collection practices during the pilot. So when collecting standard, they were following the process as they should be, which included the aseptic, aseptic cleansing, making sure that everything was done up to specifications and following their standard operating procedure, even though they were having to bring in a new product that they may or may not be familiar with, they were still utilizing and following the procedure as our numbers have shown. Next slide, please. So at the end of our 16 weeks, I submitted a survey to all of the staff. There were 215 surveys that were sent out and 74 individuals replied back to us. Um, this is showing one of the results. So this would have this was actually question one on the survey, which was, was I able to easily incorporate the use of the device into the draws? And as you can see from the from the chart that is showing, the majority of the staff really didn't have a problem incorporating the device. So we know that it can be used. So are there any pitfalls from its use? Next slide, please. We did in fact receive comments on the difficulty with using these devices. And a lot of it had to do with the tubing on the device. The tubing was too short in order to follow the process that was set by the company for filling this bottle. This bottle had to be at, at level, so straight up and down. Um, it also had to, 
So with it being straight up and down, you had to ensure that the patient didn't move their arm and that the collection device was accurately stabilized as well as if the patient could be moved or they couldn't be moved. So this created a lot of, a, a lot of um, issues for the staff in regards to ergonomic issues. At times they'd be bent over or kneeling for extended periods of times to meet the requirements of this, which ultimately long-term could potentially cause safety concerns or problems or ergonomic concerns for the staff. It was also difficult to fill tubes, um, any additional tubes or even the vials. If the patient's veins were not very good, if the blood flow was not good, or if it wasn't producing as it should be, which generally is always a small percent of patients, but it does in fact happen. The diversion device was noted as being hard to manipulate, which was another concern is, is if this is hard to manipulate and hard to utilize, does it really fit into our process? And again, if patients aren't sitting still, if they have tremors or the medications are causing them to be jumpy or anything like that, like this, we could we saw instances in which this device really wasn't good because you couldn't stabilize it adequately enough to ensure that there was no harm done to the patient. And then of course, as I said, ergonomic challenges as well as difficult to collect other labs after using the, the device because you had to take it apart or put another piece onto it so that you could actually fill other collection tubes if they were being requested by our providers. Next slide, please. So question four really was what we just talked about. And that was, um, could you use this device on all of our patient populations? As you can see, uh, or as you can see, there was a strongly agree that they could not use the device with certain patient populations. And there's a, you know, it, it's, it's really speaking for itself here in regards to the staff found issues, which we've just talked about, that prevented them from always using the device. Thereby, it affected the compliance rate. Next slide, please. So, I summarized all of the information that I received back in regards to the 74 survey, um, 74 patient techs who, serve, who provided survey responses. And a lot of those comments regarded difficult patient um, populations for device use. And those items that were seen were truly small veins or fragile veins. Um, and those would actually at times rupture because of the pressure, the uncontrollable pressure, because with this particular direct to media device, you, the technician didn't have control of the pressure being applied. Combative or behavioral health patients. Um, this, not only utilizing this device in this situation puts the patient at harm, it also puts the technicians at harm because these are the patients who are, who, as it indicates, are combative. They're, they're gonna fight. They don't want to have this done, even though it's medically necessary and or the medications they're on or their mental health condition may be causing them not to be the person that they normally are. So it was difficult to use here, difficult patient collections as well, um, not adequate blood flow. So bottles weren't able to be filled full. Hematomas or swollen arms, if patients had excessive hematomas or were maintaining a lot of fluid, this wasn't the best device to use on those types of um, patients, as well as busy rooms and or emergency situations. If the rooms were significantly busy or it was an emergency situation, it was very difficult to control and maintain that device during the collections to ensure that all the steps were followed appropriately. And it really was much easier just to grab the standard butterfly and perform the collection so that they knew that what they were collecting was going to fit the criteria for a quality specimen collection. Next slide, please. Excuse me. So after we reviewed all of the information, 
the team that was put together and talked about it, we knew that we had to do something different because the staff really did state in that first survey, it can't be used all the time. We really want to use it all the time, but we can't. We would like to have a syringe option. So in speaking with the company, we discovered that they did have a syringe option. And as a group, we discussed it and decided that we really did need to do an, an additional eight-week pilot and compare the two diversion devices. So we would continue with the direct to media. So those staff that wanted to use direct to media could, and then we would also provide a syringe draw option for those staff who under no circumstance wanted to do the direct to media because it just didn't work for them. The pilot or the validation information all remained the same. It was the same limitation on the documentation. So again, now not only did staff have to document the direct to media device that they had been using in phase one, they now had to add, we had to add a secondary option for them, which we've already discussed can potentially affect the availability to get true data. We also needed to ensure that the draws that were being done were again, the peripheral blood cultures on our adult patient populations from 18 to 100, and that there were no pediatric or line draws included in there. And during that phase two period, we drew 7,383. And then the documented use for the direct to media syringe diversion was 2,658. So our compliance rate did go up by 10% in comparison to the first phase, but still we didn't hit that greater than 75% compliance rate. So another additional survey was run. Next slide, please. But overall, When you looked at the contamination rates between the direct to media and the contamination rate of the syringe diversion device, there was a significant difference. So in phase two, again, they utilized two, and that is direct to media, which had eight contaminants for a 0.5% contamination rate, and then for the syringe, there was 13 contaminants with a 1.1%. So, and then 1.3% using the routine draw, which is our standard draw. So that means no device was utilized. So the overall contamination rate, again, on phase two was the same as phase one, 1.1%. Next slide, please. So we did learn that the results can, were consistent between phase one and the direct immediate diversion device. It doesn't, but the device itself does lower the blood culture contaminations. We found that contamination or that compliance increased by offering an option between direct to media and syringe base, but the measured overall compliance was still significantly low and we didn't meet our objectives. And the overall contamination rate for the pilot was 1.1%, which did not decrease to our target, which was 50% reduction. Next slide, please. So we then, um, the phlebotomists were surveyed with their experience, concerning their experience on the syringe and the themes, there were certain themes that were identified just as there were with the direct to media. There was an inability to stabilize the needle while they were swapping out syringes. In lab services in our area, we utilize the 30 cc syringe to pull our, our um, blood cultures. These didn't come with that. So you had to swap out syringe. The tubing again was too short. So the needle was actually accidentally being pulled out of the patient as they were trying to swap out syringes, which again caused, has the potential to cause harm not only to the patient, but to the technician. And there was an inability to use a smaller syringe to control the collection pressure. Next slide. So lessons learned. What did we learn? Well, we learned that the direct to media device piloted is capable of reducing contamination rates to less than 0.5%. 
We also learned that the compliance was lower than reported in other studies, but only due to the difficulties with the ergonomics and truly the aspects of the draw using device. Um, we know that it's critical to evaluate evaluate the usability, and also to get the technicians who use the device involved and get their feedback. You truly have to collect your own data before making decisions to implement blood culture diversion devices. Because if you don't, you really don't know how it's going to work in your facility and how your staff can adapt to it and will it work for each of your patients. And if you do implement without considering these factors, you really need to monitor that contamination rate carefully assess your compliance, your contamination rates by device and draw type after in implementing to ensure that you make the right decisions for your facility. Next slide. Dr. Karen, I'll let you have the summary. Thanks, Michelle. So again, uh, summing up our, our talk, blood cultures are a fundamental tool in the fight against uh, bacteremia, sepsis, and septic shock. Getting very early interventions, so within an hour of suspected infection or sepsis, getting that blood culture done is essential. Um, blood culture contamination uh, adds certainly cost uh, and delays treatment, extends hospital tray stays, leads to bacterial resistance. And so a number of studies have now shown that adding blood culture diversion devices to the tool belt of uh, proper skin disinfection and the competency and training of the staff doing collections, as in some facilities, lower blood culture contamination rate less than 1%. So the 3% target may no longer be appropriate to say if you're under 3%, uh, job well done and, and you move on to some other issue. Um, blood culture diversion devices may significantly reduce contamination rate, but as Michelle said, um, you should evaluate these locally before implementing. And, and um, obviously you have to have a device that your staff can use and experience that the use of the device. And I think that blended contamination rate is key because as we said, I think there are significant limitations to documenting who used it during our pilot. Um, but even if we significantly undercounted the use of the devices, the blended contamination rate is really the effect of the device in the end, whether we could document the use, we would want to see that blended rate go down to our target and certainly be less than 1%, and we were not able to achieve that. So with that, I think we are um, open to any questions for Michelle and I, and I have the question answers open. There's nothing in there currently. So if you would like to ask a question, you'll have just a few minutes here to do that, uh, and, and we're happy to answer them if you submit them in the question and answer uh, functionality of the webinar. Um, so the question about the Mayo uses the BD Ultra Touch, how does that impact utilization of the device? Uh, because the manufacturers, there are two manufacturers of these devices, neither one currently makes a product with an Ultra Touch. So I think that's a better question for Michelle, it's different. <laughs> and we had to let our staff know, hey, this is, Different, but did we hear a reaction specifically to the lack of availability of the Ultra Touch? So, one of the biggest questions that the staff asked is: is can we get these with Ultra Touches because they are used to those? And um, this was brought to the company, but again, they had to use the item that that was provided to them. So, rather than using a 21 gauge or a, a 23 gauge, which a lot of our technicians use with that, that BD Ultra Touch, they actually were using a 21 gauge. But it did it did impact the utilization of the device because of the the I, I don't know how much the needle played in it, but the inability to to um, maintain a certain pressure on that device and to control the, the pressure that was being utilized for the blood draw really was the impacting factor. The needle, we, they could accommodate for that. Thanks. Another question just submitted, did we check positivity rates between diversion device and regular draw? We didn't do that. That 
So those studies on yield, you end up needing to review multiple cultures and the medical record and discharge diagnosis, and then say the patient in the end was determined to have bacteremia, and did we find it? Um, all the data we showed, it was a lot of data to collect, but it was easier to pull. That would have required chart review and, and a lot of outcome data that, that was just beyond the scope of this. Um, then the question, and Michelle, I'll let you speculate. Do you think compliance would have been higher if the devices had ultra touch on it? No, I don't. I don't know that that needle was the biggest driver of the compliance issue. Uh, I truly think um, I don't know that having a BD ultra touch butterfly on that device would have um, specifically helped with that difficult venous access to the patients because again, with the direct immediate comes down to the availability for the technician themselves to, to control the pressure or the force. The same with the syringe because the inability to use a smaller syringe or a larger syringe, either than the 10 or the 20, they don't have all the control of that, of that factor. So I'm not sure the ultra touch really was a huge impact. I think it really was about control. Thanks. And I'll, one more question we probably have time to address. Have you considered or experimented with a waste tube instead of the manufactured devices, which are two of them are out there because of the expense of the device? We have not. As we showed, the data showed the direct to media seemed to perform better than the syringe because you have less manipulation after the fact. So we based our pilot on, on studies and data. And I, I think you know, you certainly could do that, but you may find that if you have a process that requires, you know, a waste tube and manipulation and additional a a a devices that um, that you end up not seeing the benefits, but certainly would be less costly. You would have to sort of do that pilot on your own and, and collect the data we did. And if we happen to work in an institution, that would be fantastic. But we, we did not try that. So I think we are probably out of time for more questions. Heidi, does that sound right? Yep, so like Dr. Karen mentioned, we're at the top of the hour here. So I would like to first thank Dr. Karen and Michelle for a great presentation. And then um, thank you to everyone who attended today as well. If you do have questions um, that were not addressed during today's session since we ran out of time, um, or if you have additional questions you think of later, please include them on the evaluation that will be sent to you tomorrow via Zoom. So watch for that email to come through. Note that laboratory credit is extended for this program. So upon finalizing your evaluation, you'll be have the option to claim credit and print your certificate. If you had registered for this webinar and joined by phone only, please email us at mcleducation at mayo.edu if you did not receive the evaluation via email. As a reminder, this program was recorded and will be archived on our website in a few weeks. Thank you again for joining us today for today's webinar, and I hope everyone has a good day. Thank you for participating. Please click the button below to complete the evaluation and obtain credit.